forgotten his name. Nicholas, I think it was. Remember Nicholas asked a question and I didn't get to it. That's an OHS issue, guys. What are you, oh. Look at that. It's a death trap. I remember I was motorcycling through the lecture theatre one day and uh, Nicholas um, asked a really good question. Remember in the last lecture and I said um, to see me in the break because I, I didn't understand it straight away. The question was this. If we're in this sort of zone three, this not generating every possible program, for example, he suggested programs that don't contain loop instructions and also that don't contain write to memories, those programs can never be long, but the problem is those programs terminate really quickly anyway. And if you have to go through memory testing to see if you've got one of those programs, it could take just as long as actually running the damn program. And this is a very astute question. There's no point in doing an optimization, which you've proved is correct, if the cost of doing the optimization is approximately the same as the savings you get from doing the optimization. Especially because you have to pay that cost for every program, but you only get the benefit from those programs that have the, uh, yeah, okay. So, so yeah, that's right. That's a really good question and a really good observation. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, one last question I wanted to do, which is, what's the, que what's the complexity of how many? What do you think its complexity is? Did you notice, I, I, I put it in because I wanted you to bump into this wall. What do you reckon? Anyone, anyone want to guess what the complexity of it is? No, what's its complexity function? Is it quadratic? Is it linear? Is it exponential? Is it, but maybe it's not exponential. Maybe it's n to the 70 or something. What do you reckon? Let's have votes. Who thinks it's some sort of polynomial that's ridiculously big like n to the 70? Who thinks it's um, exponential? Who didn't put their hands up? What do you guys think it is? Everything. What's that? Everything. Everything. <laughs> it's like Zen. It's like, <laughs> do you include the permutations of instructions? What's that? Do you include the permutations of instructions? Including the permutations, yeah. Well, then it would be a factorial one. No, it does a permutation in linear time. Yeah, but if you were looking at all possible permutations. Oh, no, 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 the how many function. So let's be precise about what I meant. Oh, maybe I didn't ask that question formally enough. We've got a function called how many? Well, we've got it. Let's just go down here. We've got an emulator function. I assume most people did it with emulators. The emulator takes in takes in n bytes, which is the size of the program. And the emulator, you know, who knows what the output of that is. We don't care. Because all we care is how long it takes the emulator to run before it puts out whatever it puts out. How, what's the complexity of the emulator? As n increases, what's, how, what, how, how does the worst case input, what's the running time of the worst case input? How does that change? What's that? No, we're only looking at terminating programs. Okay. Yeah. No, no, the emulator gets given a program and runs and does something. How long does it take to run? What's that? Okay, so if we're asking for the complexity of the emulator, we want to know how long it takes to run, how that varies as a function of the size of the input. So as you add an extra byte, What's the worst? <clears throat> this is freaking me out. <laughs> this is a very simple revision question. Stroke, entirely new topic in this course. Let's approach it as an entirely new topic in the course. <laughs> it is sometimes very interesting to work out the complexity of a function. We can talk about the memory complexity or the time complexity. When we're talking about the time complexity, what I want to know is how long it takes the function to run, how, or, or an algorithm. How long it takes the algorithm to solve, how much work the algorithm has to do to solve the problem. 
Now, it's, I'm interested in how the amount of work, let's say the amount of work is a function called work. You feed in the input to the function and it tells you how much work it has to do. Like, I remember once we calculated, we got 512 cycles. Yeah, we had some program, we calculated the amount of work, it was 512 cycles. So, work done by the emulator, given the input to the emulator, how much work does it do? And it will be a number, the amount of work it does, depending on how you've implemented the emulator. But we noticed that although that number might fluctuate depending on how you've implemented the emulator and what chip you're running the emulator on and all sorts of stuff like that, the, the general function that describes how this changes is independent of how we've implemented the emulator, whether we've written in C or Java or whatever. The idea is, as the input to the emulator gets bigger, does it take longer to run? If I put a two-byte program in, does it take longer to run than a four-byte program? No. Does a four-byte program take longer than a two-byte program? Well, it depends. And we discovered that this question wasn't an easy to answer question because it depends exactly what the input is. So we then realized, or in this new topic, we're now introducing this concept of, well, let's only think about the worst case. So how much does it take in the worst case? So the worst case two-byte program, how long does that take to run? 31. How long does the worst case three-byte program take to run? 90-something. What, 95? Okay. 94. How long does the longest four-byte program take to run? 159. How long does the longest five-byte program take to run? 266. If I plotted this, the question is what curve do I get? This is what the complexity of the function is. So the complexity of the emulator is the name of this curve. What, what do we suspect it is? Has anyone worked it out? Did anyone investigate it? It looks exponential. It's not exponential once n gets bigger. Yes? After seven, it's not exponential? Are you sure? How do you know? Did you brute force it go past seven up to eight? Did your brute force it go up to eight? Yeah. So the gap from seven to eight wasn't a big gap. Yeah, it's just a small but did you then do from eight to nine? Uh, not really. No. So it might just be a local anomaly or something like that. I'm sort of expecting that this is going to grow exponentially. We won't know unless we try all permutations and we try all values of n. You now are able to do that with your programs. But we suspect that the emulator has exponential complexity. So if the emulator has exponential complexity, what's the complexity of how many? How, what does how many take in? Takes in n, the number n. What else does it take in? The permutation. All right, uh, how big is the permutation? It's um, 64 bits. Isn't it? 16 4-bit values. How big is n? Well, it depends what n is. If n, if you're sticking in the number 1, it's 1 bit. If you're sticking in the number 2, it's 2 bits. Sticking in the number 3, it's 3 bits. Sticking in the number 4, it's 3 bits. Is that right? Number 4 is 3 bits? Yeah. Stick in the number 5, 6, and 7, it's still 3 bits. Stick in 8, and it's 4 bits. So, actually, what we care about when we say we're sticking in n, let's say we stick in the size. Let's not call it n, let's call it size because we're going to get confused. This, the size of the input to how many is the size of the input to the emulator plus the permutation. If we call that size there k, say, the size of the input is k plus 64. So given k plus 64, how much work is your emulator going to have to do in the worst case? Well, if your emulator, I mean, we can't talk, we can only talk about the complexity of a particular algorithm. If your emulator does a brute force search and goes through all programs, then how many programs does it have to consider? Uh, 
there's 16 to the k programs. So the amount of work it has to do is what? 16 to the, and this is our input. It's 16 to the n minus 64 is the amount of work it's got to do. Oh, sorry, it's the number of cases it's got to try. And for each of those cases, for each of those cases, it has to do 2 to the n work. Yeah. It sort of looks like it's going to be like a nested exponential. Do you think that's going to give us exponential or not? So here's my challenge for you. But this is actually the first question of the tute this week. What is the complexity of how many? You'll have to look up the formal definition of big O, which is on Wikipedia, say, and check. I'll actually, oh no, I'll reproduce it in the question and work out if it really is exponential. Because you know, there's nothing that annoys me more than someone saying something's exponential when it's not exponential. Okay, so that was your challenge slash revising a really key topic in the course slash expanding on an interesting new topic I introduced today. Because <laughs> I, I want you to know that stuff. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to talk about the project. In, who's looked at the project so far? Is everyone in their teams? And you know your team? Good. Hopefully you and your partner, your team member, have played the game a fair bit and now understand the game. This week, shh, 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 this week in your tutorial, the, the assignment spec is now up. This week, in your tutorial, what you will do is you will get together with everyone else in your tut and you will design an ADT. You won't actually implement it. You won't design how it's implemented. You'll just design what functions have to be in the interface. I'm going to write the project out as a series of steps that it involves. Let's start from the end because the end is the exciting thing. At the end, what do you get to do? You get to... You get to stake Dracula in the belly button. <laughs> so this is the exciting end point. Let's work backwards from there. How do we get to here? It's like a flashback. Okay, we're doing this whole thing as a flashback. Now, to catch Dracula and stake him through the heart, shh, or the belly button, <laughs> um, or the kidney, it looks like, it's a drone killer, we call him, <laughs> through the liver. Um, all right, here's what's happening. We have, every night, starting in a couple of weeks' time, we will be running a competition. And you will be submitting artificial intelligence programs to that competition. And these little programs you submit that you and your partner will write will play this game. They will play, as you know, it's a four-person game. They will play one of the characters in the game. And they'll be run in parallel with other people playing the other characters of the game. And your tutors will have written a character to play Dracula. And your characters will wander around trying to find Dracula. And your tutor's Dracula will run away and try and hide and not get killed. And you guys will try and kill Dracula. Okay. So, really, your pr objective before this is to... Submit a program, uh, uh, submit a hunter AI to the comp. Because if you don't submit it, it can't be in the comp. And if it can't be in the comp, then you can't do this. <laughs> now, how this assignment works is that we run the comp every second night. And at the end of the assignment, when we say the assignment's over now, you've got all your marks already. It's how you've gone in the comp. So please don't, when I say, ah, and today is the last day of the assignment, the project finishes today, I don't want someone to come up to me and say, I haven't quite finished yet, can I have an extension? Or I'll only just get it in in time, because it's at that point too late to hand it in, because it's all over. Does that make sense? It's like, it's not something you hand in at the end, 
It's something we do together all the way along. So if you submit your hunter into the competition, then when the competition runs, you get some marks. And if you don't submit a hunter to the competition, then when the competition runs, you don't get any marks. Does that make sense? So it's different to other assignments. I wanted to make that really clear. So the previous step, step N minus one, is submit a hunter to the competition. And then that hunter will team up with other hunters and will kill Dracula and earn you marks and glory and all sorts of things like that. So step N minus two, I reckon, this should be like a comic, shouldn't it? Uh, step N minus two is write a hunter. AI. Now the idea is write something really stupid initially and just improve it whenever you feel like it. So get something stupid into the comps early on so at least you're in the comps and then over time improve it. There's a whole lot of randomness going on here so even a completely stupid player um, that just stands still the whole time is bound to occasionally kill Dracula by Dracula just bumping into him repeatedly <laughs> and you'll get some marks and that'll be awesome. Okay, so write a Hunter AI. Now how do you write a Hunter AI? <laughs> this bit looked hard, this bit looked easy, but this bit looked strange. How, how are you going to write your Hunter AI? Well here's how the Hunter AI works. You just have to write one, you have to write, submit a file called Hunter.c and in it is one function that's called something like, decide move? Make move. Make your move. Move Hunter. There's some move function anyway. And what you have to do is you have to write that function and then you've done the whole assignment. And this assignment, whose name we don't know and I can't tell you for various occult reasons, I'll write it backwards. <laughs> and upside down. <laughs> <laughs> this function, what it takes in is, it takes in an ADT. And that ADT describes the game. And what it spits out, it doesn't spit anything out. So your, your function, we give you an ADT that describes the game. And then you query that ADT to work out what to do. And that ADT, which describes the whole world from your point of view, so we call that ADT the hunter view. It's your, the whole world according to you. There might be a function in the ADT called something like, where was Dracula seen last? So you'd go, ADT, where was Dracula seen last? Your function would go. And the ADT would say, he was last seen in Jamaica. <laughs> okay. And you go, cool, thanks. And then you could say, um, um, ADT, uh, where is Mina Harker at the moment? And they could go, she's in Berlin. And you go, ADT, where's Van Helsing at the moment? You're Van Helsing, fool. Oh, yes. <laughs> ADT, where's Dr. Seward? He's in Madrid. ADT, where am I? You're in Madrid too. Okay, so you can ask questions like that and you can say things like, where was Dracula three moves ago? We don't know, no one discovered him then, but we know he was at la on land. Uh, or, where was Dracula four moves ago? We discovered him, he was in um, Castle Dracula. And you can say, how much health have I got left? How much health has Dracula got left? You can just ask questions like that. And this ADT, which is the most convenient and remarkable and wonderful thing you've ever discovered, you're gonna be so pleased you have it, just answers every question you could ever ask it. So all your hunter has to do is then just ask some cunning questions and you've already played the game Get your hunter to do whatever you do when you play the game. So think, oh yeah, okay, well Dracula was sort of near me last time and I think he's probably over that way there and the fastest way of getting from there to there is there. And so the next move I'm going to do that. Now when, as soon as you've worked out what, what move you want to make, you call another function. Which, you, there's a function you're provided with that controls the whole world. And that function's called register move. And you say, register move, I want to go to Berlin. Register move Berlin and you, it's you telling the outside world you want to go to Berlin and if you want you can keep thinking for a while because we're going to let your function run for something like one and a half seconds. So you can say register move Berlin and then you go oh time's not up I'm still here I'm not dead yet ah. and then you can think even more cunningly and think well actually I could have gone to Berlin but it would be better to go to Frankfurt so then you go register move Frankfurt and now you move to Frankfurt instead of moving to Berlin and what happens is we're just going to let your function run for one and a half seconds or however long it is and then we're going to kill it. And whatever the last move you've registered is, that's the move you're going to make. So there's no reason you can't just make an initial stupid move, stay in the same spot. Yeah, it took one second to say, a split second to say, and then think more and then say a better move. And then you can incrementally make better and better moves, and at some point we'll kill you when you run out of time, but that way, you, you, does that make sense? Yep, yep. 
So this is all your function does. Given the world's most amazing ADT, you implement the strategy that you've informally started to produce by playing the game with your partner. You and your partner write a hunter that queries the ADT and registers what move you have to make. And we'll do all the rest, move you around, do the graphics, the blood, everything. So that's looking good. Write the hunter ADT, this is all belongs to this blobby here. Write the hunter AI. Okay, so that's move n minus two. Shh, 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 shh. So we not only need move n minus three, we're nearly back. So how could we reach this wonderful state here? There's only one thing missing. What is it? Write an ADT. Oh yes, you've got to write the ADT. Implement the hunter view ADT. So if you've implemented it, then your hunter can use it, then you can go in the comp and kill Dracula. This is due soonish, end of week nine or something, I think. No, no, not this week. No, no, no. Even before, we haven't got, that's further back in time. You have to know the game exists. You know that you know the game exists? Yes, thank you. You'd better design the ADT. So here's where you say, oh, the ADT should have all these functions. It should have a function like, where was Dracula seen last? And where did Dracula move two moves ago? And where am I now? And things like that. So you come up here with the interface. In other words, you write hunterview.h. Ba bum, that's due this week. Then next week, you implement it. And then the week after, you write the hunter. And then you just hunt, 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 hunt until, da da. But there's more. Because before you can design the ADT, what do you need to be able to do? This is defined in the interface. Yep, that's right. But even before that, what's that? You need to read the rules. You need to play the game. Everybody play the game. Read the rules. You've already done this. You've done it. Well done. Everyone's getting full marks for that. That's awesome. And a big gold tick. Now, before you do that, what do you have to do? You have to enroll in this course. You've done that too. <laughs> before you do that, we're nearly out of time. No, you were enrolled in the course. What did you have to do before you were enrolled in the course? Be born. Okay. There's an important thing around there. Okay, so, shh, shh, shh. no, I wasn't, oh, I was implying, uh, you know, uh, okay. All right, all right, let's just shut up. Okay, all right, so, you get the idea. This comic book here, one, the student that is the quietest, shh, shh, can take these blackboards home, but everyone else has to copy this down. These are the steps for the assignment. You've already done this, you've already done this, you've already done this. This week, you're doing this. But you don't do it alone. None of this assignment you have to do alone. If anyone says at any time during this assignment, I know, let's all split up, you say, no, we stay together. So this is done in your tute. So in your tute this week, you all get together and argue and debate what should go in the interface. Let me do the two sides of the debate. Would you like to be one side of the debate? What's your name? Sam. Sam. Daniel. 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 Do you want to stand up there? Okay. I want you to argue that the interface should be big and complex and have everything in it. I want you to argue the interface should be small and have nothing in it. Okay? No. Uh, the interface should be big and have everything in it. Why? Because that way we can ask it lots of questions and find out lots of interesting things. More. You can't possibly come back to that. No, uh, we don't need a lot of it. It will cost a lot of time. What? What do you mean? Hmm? What do you mean? 
Yeah, it will take more time because we only have one point five second to before our function end. Ah. Ah. Uh -huh. What do you say to that? If you make it so small, it can't do anything. It's useless. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, hey. Oh. So you can see there's two sides here. If you make a really big, enormous, expressive ADT, this makes running the hunter amazingly easy. Especially, for example, if there's a, a function in the ADT called "What's the best move to make." <laughs> But the downside is, if the ADT is really big and complex, when you write it, you have to do a big, ugly, complex thing. And you only have a week to do that. And you only have a week, no, you have 10 days, roughly, to do that. Yeah. But if it's too small and trivial, then your hunter can't do anything. Because there's no, you can say, where's Dracula now? I don't understand that question. <laughs> <laughs> so you have this dilemma. Now notice, it's just really a work transfer. How do you want to split the complexity between these two things? How do you, what do you reckon the pretty ideal complexity split is? Um, how long do you have to have your hunter hunt? So you've got the same amount of time. Oh, well, you're stuck with this forever. No, oh, no, you've got roughly the same amount of time to do both. Yeah, yeah, I reckon 50-50. Just because conceptually, this is a conceptually hard problem if it's all mushed together. But broken into these two parts is quite trivial. So, yeah. Don't write an AD2 that's too banal or you'll just kick yourself and you reckon you won't be able to do anything. Don't write an ADT that's too ambitious, or you'll spend all your time coding the ADT and you'll hate that. And the ADT runs through spots and various things like that and constantly gets tested. So if you put your hand up, say, in your tute this week and say, I think the ADT should have this function, everyone, before they say yes, has to be aware that that means they'll be implementing that function. But if no one puts their hand up and says that function's got to be in there, be aware that in a week or two's time you'll all be kicking yourselves as all the other tute groups are just staking Dracula and beating you because there's this inter -tute rivalry we're going to have going on and your tute is just lame and crap. <laughs> okay, yes? Um, so by the end of the project, everyone will have the same ADT? Or oh, good question. The by the end of the tute, by the end of the project, will everyone have the same ADT? No. Every tute will have the same ADT. Now, once, you've written, once your writ tute has decided on what the ADT is, then in your pairs you will implement it and in your pairs you will write the HANA. Aim for a good one, but just don't make it too good. But aim for a good one or you're stuffed. When you write your ADT, you will also write tests to test the ADT. When you're in the hunt, your hunter will come along and expect an ADT. Whose ADT are we going to give the hunter? Someone else from your two group. You'll never get your own ADT. So, if you have violated abstraction, you won't be able to rely on that because it's very unlikely that the other person will have violated abstraction in exactly the same way. So your code has to work with everyone else's code. Now what's the possible problem with that? Their code could be crap. Specifically, their code could be, what's that? Incorrect. You will only get partnered up, you will only get the brain, I want you to think of this as like other people in the tutor contributing the brain that goes into your hunter. You'll only get a brain that passes your unit tests. So your unit tests are like a shield of steel that protects your hunter. So you're, you're saying, you're writing a hunter, and everyone else in this row is in your chute. And now we're the markers. We're going to say, all right, we're going to give your hunter someone else's brain. Ha-ha, we'll try his ADT. And we run it against your test. You fail it. We can't give it to you. His ADT, run against the test. You fail it. His ADT, run against the test. It passes. We give it to you. Your hunter does something stupid and explodes. Whose problem is it? Mine. Yours. Same, yeah, yeah. Same if I fail everyone's ADT. If you fail everyone's ADT, well, you know, if you fail an incorrect ADT, if you fail an incorrect program, then you uh, you fail the spots. Yeah. yeah. So don't fail a program that's actually correct. You have to pass your own ADT. If you don't pass your own ADT, then you don't get into the comp at all. That's just an early entry thing. <laughs> And that means, if worst comes to worst, we'll be able to give you your own ADT if everyone else in the tutes ADT doesn't work. Yes? Is it Richard? Yeah. Yes. Um, what's to stop you from getting like, a slow orientation ADT? Ah, that's a good question. Not only because the ADT suck because it's incorrect, which you can protect with unit tests, it could suck because it's slow. What do you think you should do to protect against a slow one? You could test for that. But you can only test for things that are in the interface. 
So you would have to make sure that your ADT interface that everyone on the tube agreed to had time limits in it that were testable. And there can't be some debate about what's right or what's wrong. It has to be black and white when you're running unit tests. If you fail someone, it has to be clear that it's wrong. So you can't just say, has to be fast. Oh, no, I didn't think that was fast. You failed. Has to be on this input takes this long or something like that. Yeah, if that's an important property that you want your ADTs to have, then put it in the interface. If you don't put it in the interface, you get whatever you get. But of course, everyone has a strong incentive to writing a fast ADT and running good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could just do what we said before. And make it do different moves based on how much of the ADT that you use. Oh, yeah. So that's right. The idea with even if you get a slow ADT, hopefully you're going to put out a dumb move early, then a better move, then a better move, then a better move. So the times you get paired with a really slow one, then you just won't make the best of all possible moves. Now, when we put it in a hunt, a third of the time, you'll be hunting with clones of yourself. So you're, it'll be just four of your programs. So if you've got a good strategy, a third of the time, it'll just be you guys. You're controlling all four people. A third of the time, you'll just be with people from your chew. And a third of the time, you'll be randomly with people. If you just, you get the points, all four of you are trying to kill Dracula. So if your guy's lame and everyone else is good, you're going to get some points just scumming off them. Because those three will get together and kill Dracula and you'll just be going, la li la li la and say, thanks for the points. But, but that won't help you when there's just four of your guys there. You're going, ah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, and if your whole chute is really good, and then when you're together and your whole chute, you all do really well. So the idea is that chutes that are really good will tend to actually give everyone good marks and everyone will tend to do really well. Are there questions behind here? Do, anti do not turn up to your chute tomorrow when you're designing the interface and go, duh. <laughs> Anyone have the rules? <laughs> Man, I haven't read the rules yet. Because everyone on your chute will stake you <laughs> at that point. OK. By now, you're all expected to play the game intensely with your partner and know the rules intimately. Yes? The message protocols. The message protocols. Oh, it's in the interface. How do they all talk to each other? It's in the interface. Oh, but yeah, that's a good question. Shh, shh, shh. One last little tweak. Feel free to ignore this till the last second. But at the last second, this could turn out to be a decider. In addition to making your move, you can also give a message. Every time you make a move, you can, when you register your move, you don't just say Berlin, you also say some message. And the message might be, ha ha, I'm coming to get you. And that'll just be displayed as a taunt on the screen whenever the move is made. But the message might contain more than that. It might contain some sort of protocol that says, I'm moving this way and I intend to move here next, and I think he's probably here. If the members of your tutor all get together and agree on some protocol, you can actually coordinate your actions. And Dracula is doomed. But if you disagree on the protocol, that won't work. But at least you can communicate with yourself. But if your chew can come up with a simple protocol, you can coordinate and kill Dracula. Downside is Dracula can also read all the taunts. So if your tutors work out what you're doing, <laughs> they'll modify their Dracula to think, oh, he's going there next. <laughs> yeah, OK. So you might not want to use this at all, or you might. It's up to you. Yes? Will our tutors be uh, shh, shh, shh. Will your tutors assist you in any way at all? Yeah. They will, they will, if your interface is insane, they might drop a few hints saying, are you really sure you don't want a function to ask where you are? <laughs> <laughs> but they'll try to leave it up to you. Um, they won't write the ADT, you write the ADT in your pairs. Yeah. yeah. Like, say, for example, when I was stupidly complicated one, No, you guys have got to sort that out yourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is you, it's you guys doing this. You've got to kill Dracula. There's no one to help you. It's not like in the movies, there's always someone. No, you're on your own. This is what happens when Dracula comes. There's no one to help. It's just you. This is like when you're in the workplace. Okay? It's just you. So you've got to sort it out amongst yourselves. We're not there to pretend we're not there at all. Or we are there, but we're trying to run away from you because you're trying to kill us. <laughs> Question. Shh, shh, shh. These are all good questions, by the way. Oh, no. Him first. Him first. Then, then. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, your hunters only get the ADTs from your own shoot. So every, every player gets a different ADT. Yeah. Does that make sense? The brain gets put inside the player. Everyone in your shoot has the same size hole in their head for a brain and the same shape. So you can interchange brains in your shoot, but you can't interchange brains with people from other shoots. So messaging protocols will just break down? Messaging protocols will break down unless you guys secretly agree on a protocol across the whole course without telling the tutors. It, now, we have suggested one protocol, because you know there's this researching thing? If everyone researches, which means if everyone doesn't move, you find out where Dracula is, but it's just going to be one idiot that moves. 
you know, <laughs> wait, one person waits, two people wait, three people wait. <laughs> you know, so, so there's this little protocol where you can say, I, I want to, I want, there's a, what does the message say? Something like, I'm going to research now. And, and you can say this default message, and if, if everyone else says it, then you can, you can use that. Okay, so we're giving you that. You can throw that away because Dracula might make advantage of that. Dracula might think, aha, they're all not going to move. Well, I'll sneak right next to them then. And they'll never think I'm there. So, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's up to you guys to work it out however you want. You're welcome to, if you want, um, maybe I should have a forum without the tutors. Is that what you're thinking? No, it's too confusing. What, what's that? We've got forum for, there are private forums for each tutor, but the tutor can get in there, can't they? Yeah. Do you want do you want to have the tutors locked out of your private forum? Yes. <laughs> Done. Okay. What's that? Can you be the admins? If I can do it, I'll let you. Well, but you're admining yourselves. Everyone's an admin. I like it. All right. Sure. Okay. I'll do what I can. That's a great idea. Question. Uh, Richard, you had a question. Shh, answered. More questions? Yes. Oh, how does the ADT get all the information? You have asked some very good questions today. Well done. Was it Christopher? No. Benjamin? Nicholas. Nicholas. That's right. Well done, Nicholas. <laughs> well, they're similar. They're similar. It's good. Now, his question was, if you didn't hear it, how does the ADT get its information? So, we actually tell... Oh, we actually tell you... I'll leave that there so um, I don't muck it up. <laughs> We actually tell you two functions that have to be in the ADT interface. One to create the ADT and one to destroy it. And the creating ADT is called something like new hunter view. It returns a hunter view, which is whatever you define a hunter view to be, and it takes in some string. And this string is a list of all the moves made so far and every piece of information about the game that's observably determinable. And that is fed into the hunter view, and then your hunter view takes that string, processes it, and makes sure it can answer all questions. Now, in the past, here's what some students have tried to do in ADT type assignments. They've thought, I will follow the procrastination strategy, and this ADT will be a hollow, shallow shell of an ADT that does nothing at all. And those, these students will just sit quietly in the chute, and everyone chute will have one, and they will nod to every function you say should be the interface, and then they'll, at the end, just very quietly say, oh, and we should have a function to return the initial string that was used to create the ADT. This student is not planning to use your ADT at all. They're going to internalize the ADT inside their own function and recreate everything themselves. This, of course, is completely an insane design strategy, though it's quite clever in this case because it means you don't have to rely on anyone else. Does that make sense? So to stop that, we have a rule saying it should not be possible from the interface functions of the ADT to recreate the initial string. In other words, there has to be some information lost somehow. So you can't echo it back. And, don't, and then you'll think of some clever way, oh, we'll just throw away the first move and echo the whole string except for that. No. If the tutors think you're trying to violate the principle of the ADT, they'll just boop, boom, and it's all ruled out and very bad. So make sure your tutor agrees that you're not trying to violate this principle. In other words, we genuinely want to see the ADT looking after the hunter view and the hunter looking after the hunt strategy. And we do not want to see the hunter trying to reconstruct the view of the world. That should be done in here. Does that make sense? And that was a very good question. Well done. Are there any more questions? Yes? Uh, so like the tutors see our ADT, can we see the Dracula ADT? Oh, can you the tutors see the ADT? Can you see the Dracula's ADT? Yeah, because most likely the tutor will know what we are going to do. No, no, the ADT doesn't have any strategy in it. The tutor will not see your hunter. The tutor will just see how you represent the information. They'll probably steal it and use it for their own one so they don't have to write their own. So probably when you see your own one, you are seeing the tutor's one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, no, no. All the brains should be in here. This just captures information and digests it. So there are annoying things like, what cities are next to Berlin? Because if you try and move from Berlin to London in one move, it's an error and everything will crash. So you really want to know what cities are next to Berlin. 
Don't make the hunter work that out. Make the hunter view work that out. Ask all questions about the graph that is Europe in the hunter view. What's next to here? How can I get, where do I, what cities are two moves away? What's the fastest route from here to here? You know, all those sorts of questions. Whack them all in here. This guy shouldn't be doing it. Yep. Yes. Is it the same graph of Europe? Yes. Yes, we won't change the graph of Europe. You'll also need to make a graph of Europe. Where would the graph of Europe ideally live? Got it. Yes, is that a question? No, no. Questions? Okay, now this is, I hope, this assignment will test every single thing you've done in the course. Um, and it should be heaps of fun. I think we've gone right to the end without me even missing anything. I don't think I've missed anything. Are there any more questions at all? Right. Thank you for our admin day, and I look forward to seeing you with graphs on Thursday. Oh, I didn't ask. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah.